Welcome back to Chatham House's Global Forum on Forest Governance for 2021. And you're all very welcome after the quick break and our opening session uh, that we just enjoyed this morning. We're going to continue the discussion on international partnerships between consumer and producer countries to promote sustainable production and trade. And to do so, we have an excellent panel um, of experts who will share their thoughts and perspectives on how these partnerships are working, what are the lessons to take from them, and how we might look at next steps to um, have a sustained global effort to tackle illegal uh, logging and to promote sustainable forest governance. Just a reminder, this discussion is on the record. And uh, you can, and we welcome your engagement in uh, the discussion. Please enter your questions in the Q&A chat box below uh, in the Zoom feed. Uh, we're very welcome to take the floor or if you'd prefer for me to read out your question. So please do join us and we very much look forward to the discussions. For those of you who are uh, joining from different languages and with different preferences. You're also, uh, I can access the interpretation in uh, Portuguese, Spanish, French, Bahasa Indonesian, and of course, uh, English. So we will now continue our discussion. We began with a high note uh, panel, a high level panel at which we discussed and understood some of the priorities of key consumer countries, but key producer countries with regard to the voluntary partnerships agreement and the other partnership arrangements between consumer and producer countries that we've seen take place over the last two decades. We heard the importance of a multi-sectoral partnership in which private sector is also engaged both as a contributor to partnership, but also a, pro a provider of incentives for countries to commit to licensing and to tackling a sustainable forestry. We've also heard the importance of thinking about and engaging local communities to be part of the sustainable forest governance uh, initiative. And we've also heard from the uh, European Parliament the importance of uh, the role of consumer countries in uh, developing and ensuring sustainable uh, supply chains uh, for uh, timber. So now, as we move on to these more technical discussions and questions of how can we uh, sustain efforts that have been achieved to date, but also perhaps accelerate uh, some of these progress in, in the years to come. Uh, I'm joined by an excellent panel from uh, different countries around the world um, and uh, primarily um, producer countries. So from Ghana, we're joined by Chris Biko, who is chair uh, of the Board of Directors, the Forestry Development Authority and the Forestry Commission of Ghana. Welcome, uh, Chris. From Liberia and the Forestry Development Authority, we're joined by Harrison Karnuia. Uh, welcome, Harrison, today. From Indonesia, uh, we're joined by August Justianto, Director General of Forest Management and Sustainable Production of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. Welcome, August. And from the Republic of Congo, in the Ministry of Forest, we're joined by Joseph Mumbudlu. Welcome to you today. So our panelists will each speak or make presentations for about 10 minutes, and then we will be able to have a question and answer session that will conclude at 11.30 at UK time. So without further ado, let me join um, all of us in welcoming our panelists today and invite you, Chris, to take the floor to get us started. Thank you very much, um, Renata. So, um, and thank you very much again, Chatham House, for sorry, um, the opportunity to join uh, this time. It's my first time joining Chatham House uh, online. It's a good opportunity. I would like to, um, however, uh, just just uh, correct. So that that's the the title and the job job um, position that I hold at the Forestry Commission. I'm the director of the Timber Validation Department, um, and so I have been leading the my department also the coordination and implementation of all the technical elements of the VPA and also um, the 
the um, coordination of the multi-stakeholder processes. So just a, a little a little correction there. So um, I, I I I'm happy to talk about this because I think that um, over over time there's been a little bit of um, make misconception depending on what expectation one has of the v, v, VPA and talking about what has worked for the VPA, I think it is important to probably uh, look at the, at, at a big picture. It's always good to look at the big picture um, because if one tends to focus narrowly, especially on, on, on what others uh, consider as the, as, as the key output, the licensing, so much is missed. So in the next term, um, now I have nine minutes to, to do that. Um, I wanted to talk about the, what really has changed. And I, I, want to, I want to place on record that the VPA um, has been a game changer in the governance of the sector. And what has caused this, or why do we say this? Uh, first of all, because of the clarity that has come uh, out of placing what is legal timber on the table. Uh, it, is, it is a visible and easy subject to discuss. It's a visible and easy target uh, to, to, to look at and to work to. And what that has done um, is to help us to work to that standard. Um, both regulators, industry, civil society, we have a standard to work to. Um, true, there were laws in the past governing um, the, the allocation, the harvesting, the, the transportation, and all that goes with the trading timber. Um, but to, to bring it together um, under, under one, 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 one standard, has been helpful, again, to hold actors to account. And it has also been a standard that has given structure and certainly also purpose to our multi-stakeholder uh, engagements. And this is ensuring uh, sustained support and credibility as we move along. And so this, this, this is a huge, a huge um, impact that we've had from lifting up that standard and making everyone look to it, if you like. Um, the other, other thing that has worked for the VPA and which has caused it to be a game changer is that is a creation of space for participation of non-state actors uh, in, the, in the arena of policy making. And not only that, but also in the monitoring and implementation of the policy so made. So we have a shift from what pertained before the, the advent of the VPA in that um, this very thing has happened, causing transparency in the implementation of policy, and, and certainly also a growing adherence. Combine that to the earlier point I made about the clarity and the visibility of placing the standard on the table for everyone to look at, um, at growing adherence to rules and regulation. So um, to start with, I, I, I think these this two points are a clear um, cause for uh, I would not use the word jubilation, but for want of a better expression, I'll say jubilation on embarking on a journey like this, uh, because uh, these, these are gains that um, otherwise, I don't know how would, would have been achieved, uh, given that the sector was a certain trajectory. Um, the other points that has worked for the VPA is because of the curation of the space for multi circular interaction, uh, a purposeful interaction, um, it has created cohesion. Certainly, when you always put a team together or people together who work to a common purpose, once they begin to see uh, gains, um, adversarial relationships begin to change to, I mean, supportive uh, relationships. And that is what we've seen in the, in the forex sector. So there's been a cohesion of, of, of stakeholders and net, networking. In the, in, in, as recently as, as a, a week ago, when the Association of Ghana Industries uh, came together to, to, to rebirth, it was interesting to walk into the room and see that it was civil society that was actually moderating the session for them. Uh, this was not so in the past. Um, so it's, it's not merely networking, but beneficial networking that is yielding uh, results. Real unexpected alliances have been, have been formed and so the deliberative processes are becoming richer and richer by the day. Um, what have we gained again? That is causing us to describe this as a game changer. Uh, effective enforcement of forest management prescriptions. And this is turning to sustainability. Obviously, with the standard 
with the implementation of uh, forest or legality audit that is done. And that throws a lot of transparency at the outlier offices or first district offices. Um, it is tending to cause um, practitioners to adhere more and more to regulations, one, because they are being watched, and two, because clarity has come in what is uh, required of them. Um, it's, it's not possible to move away from this subject without mentioning the effective collection of revenue um, and the effective implement, implementation as well of social responsibility agreements. Um, it's, it's another area of gain where uh, communities are realizing more and more of what is due them from areas where uh, timber harvested areas that affect them. Um, the VP has brought clarity, it has, it, has had a, it has made more formal and effective how these things are implemented. And uh, certainly also worthy of mention is the reduction in debt owed to the forest administration uh, by the timber uh, uh, operators. Because again, um, there, there's clarity in the application of rules and reporting of same. Um, it, is, it is not easy to hide under any cover this time because of the frequent flashing of the situation to all for redress. I'm talking about corrective action requirements that are applied after the implementation of forest legality audits. Um, talking about what next for VPA, I would say that certainly it is important to sustain the gains. And uh, talking about these gains, it is, um, it is it's going to be a pity as, as we hear from certain quarters that VPA must change course. I think it's a, it is, um, again, for want of a better expression, uh, it's, a, it's an atrocious, atrocious um, uh, suggestion to change course at the time that we're making so much gains and at the, uh, at the, at the very brink of hitting the target that we also have to, 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 to achieve. Um, we also talking about next, uh, we, we, because of the gains that we have experienced or the kind of movement that we experience in governance in the sector, um, we, it is certainly impacting discussions that is, that is going on in the, in, the, in the other sectors, especially in Ghana, the cocoa sector. Um, I think they stand to benefit from lessons that we have learned and um, last not, but not the least, under the what's next, um, how we begin to engage other markets, considering um, the, the, the kind of strength that we are gathering for the licensing system that we have. Um, uh, and let, let, me, let me end by talking about what, what are the features, taking into consideration all the gains that we've had, what are the features for, for partnership uh, beyond the VP? Uh, I think that it is clear from the lessons or the, the things that I've mentioned that we're talking about you need uh, a mutually beneficial and uh, objectives that are relevant to parties when it comes to uh, entering into, into such uh, new partnerships. There must be parity, uh, otherwise, and there must be sovereignty, recognition of sovereignty in the partnerships, talking about external factors, and there must certainly be a sustained political engagement, which arises from a very well-planned periodic political level engagement. It must not be left at the technical level to, to, to contain. Um, internally, um, again, from the lessons that we, we are gathering, uh, it is important to ensure there's ownership, there's legitimacy and credibility. And this is achieved through policy target setting that arises out of deliberative uh, multi-stakeholder processes. And there must be transparency and inclusiveness. And so the space that we're talking about, space for continuous monitoring and interaction among stakeholders on policy issues. And certainly, when it comes to monitoring of the agreement, um, it must, reporting of progress must be a shared thing among stakeholders. Uh, it must not be led to political or technocratic level. It must be shared among st all stakeholders. And so that would sustain and ensure continuous ownership of the process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very helpful uh, introduction, Chris, into the VPAs to its benefits and in particular for underlying the importance of the partnership dimension, which I'm sure we'll come back to in the questions and answers. Now I'm going to move to the next panel speaker, but I'm going to stay in the West Africa region. And it's my pleasure to uh, invite you, uh, Mr. Karnuia Harrison, to present on Liberia's experience. Uh, so over to you. Thank you. 
Uh, Liberia is one of uh, six, uh, 15 countries, nine implementing now, and six negotiating VPA with the European Union. I was started in 2009 and it became effective in 2013. We see ourselves third in line behind Indonesia and Ghana, and we do our very best to be granting license uh, very soon. We should have had our ninth joint implementation committee by now if we didn't have uh, the situation of COVID all over the place. Like Chris said, VPA has engendered a new sense of account accountability and transparency in the forestry sector in our country since its implementation began. Mm -hmm. The National Multi-Stakeholder Monitoring Committee, which meets once a month, comprises of the government, the private sector, civil society, and affected communities. Mm -hmm. The VPA flagged capacity building that has been provided by our partners in the EU, UK, and Norway through various implementing partners have helped build the capacity of our employees and staff involved in the implementation of the FLECTI, including all the implementing partners. Improvement in tax collections ensuring benefit sharing according to the National Forest Reform Law of Liberia 2006 is one of the many important aspects of the VPA. The independent auditors are picking up problems that would never have been detected. This means, however, that the system is working. We've always believed that the VPA needs to be replicated in other uh, consumer commodities areas, such as soy, beef, cocoa, and others, because it is a beneficial uh, trade agreement between the supply side and the demand side. Abandoning VPA at this time in favor of any other program would be a waste. Whatever the European Union and its partners are contemplating in programs, I think they should be implemented side by side with the VPA. We have come a long way and we've reached the point where we think there is no turning back. We will benefit from nothing if we were to suspend VPA today and say, let's start for instance, forest partnership, et cetera. Third party verification in our country provided by the SGS has been very good and, and, and probably indispensable. Liberia has been doing this since the lifting of sanction on our country. As you all know, Liberia was sanctioned in 2003 because illegal timber proceeds was being used to fuel the war. So we had to go through series of reforms, legislative, regulatory, et cetera. The labor trade software that was developed by SGS, which is doing taxation, tracking of timbers, and everything is reducing human discretion. Consequently, we are becoming efficient every day. Liberia will never want to go back to those days of old. The national multi-stakeholders are now the biggest uh, uh, management team in the forestry sector thereby taking monopoly of managing forests from the government. That means also that the government cannot illegally grant any forest contract uh, without 
the mortal stakeholder knowing and saying something. VPA is also contributing to the reduction in forest uh, degradation and deforestation, which is beneficial for mitigating climate change and global warming. However, we think that more needs to be done in that direction. Because like in our country in 2009, we passed the community right law, which gives the right to the communities to determine what happens to their forests. The first choice has been commercial forestry, granting third party entry to logging companies to harvest their timbers, pay them royalty, land rentals, etc. For forests to remain standing and continue to contribute to the mitigation of climate change and global warming, I think these communities need to be compensated for the ecosystem services that the forest provides. Liberia, as the biggest forest country in the sub-region, and when I mean sub-region, the Upper Guinea forest, which runs from Togo to uh, La Guinea, is yet to receive any form of compensation for ecosystem services. The process has been long, tedious. We signed agreement with Norway on the fringes of the United Nations General Assembly in New York in uh, 2014. Today, we are still working on different technical aspects, which has to do with measuring, reporting, verification, et cetera. And of course, as these continue, it discourages people who want to keep the forest standing. In our view, the VPA flight is an important starting point and mutually beneficial to the participating partners. But we also need to look at everything that keeps the world going cool for everybody. Liberia will continue to do his best to keep VPA going and to reach the point where we are going to be uh, licensing our timbers. So I stop there to give time to uh, questions and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harrison. And uh, you made you made uh, a number of important points. One underscoring that the VPA, by having independent auditors, that picking up problems can help uh, solve problems. In other words, uh, and you also made the the point that I think was echoed by Madame Matonde in her opening remarks this morning, of the importance of these large scale forests for the entire planet to navigate climate change, to keep our planet sustainable, to keep our planet cool, and how to think about local communities uh, role in that, how to uh, build local support for this global endeavor for a global public good and how to find uh, sustainable ways of enabling uh, local communities uh, to benefit, at least benefit for their sustenance in, in, these, in this effort. Uh, so thank you very much. And we'll come back to that in the questions, I'm sure. Uh, let me now turn to the experience of Indonesia uh, and August Justianto. Uh, August, uh, we look forward to hearing you, Indonesia's experience of the international partnerships and the VPA. Over to you. Thank you, Renata. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, I would like to uh, give presentation regarding the Indonesian uh, progress on uh, collective VPA. As you know, that uh, international government partnership is achieved to promote the sustainable production and trade. I would like to 
I'll share with you the lessons from SPLK or Timberlake Legality Assurance System and the key priorities in Indonesia. The lesson from uh, SPLK, uh, the impacts of forest governance reform implemented under the FLECTI uh, framework. You know that uh, we have a long, long uh, struggle to deal with the international partners, especially we have a 10 years experience in working with international partners to negotiate and implement FLECTI VPA through the multi-stakeholder process. We do it since uh, 2001 until 2009. There is a VPA negotiation intensively and provide uh, leeway for uh, perfecting of SPLK. And then in the year of 2011, we launched a fee legal logo for legal timber and timber products. In the year of 2013, Indonesia and the EU signed a VPA in Brazil and uh, Timber Legality Information System starts to operate in uh, January 2013 and is accessible through the link in the website. And then in the year of 2016, uh, Indonesia issues first flag license for timber product export to AU member. And in the year of 2017, 2018, uh, we do the implementation period Indonesia has reviewed and improved the implementation of timber legality assurance system. And 2019, UK and Indonesia signed voluntary partnership agreement on forest law enforcement, governance, and trade in timber products. I would like to inform you that, uh, I'm sorry, um, there is a problem here. I would like to inform you that, uh, The SVLK uh, covers the timber industry at, at a huge uh, nationwide scale. You know that uh, since 2013 until uh, March 2021, 20, uh, the Silk has issued more than 1.4 a million fee legal documents, including FLECTI license for AU and UK destination to support timber product export with a total value of 77 billion US dollar. So you can see, I'm sorry, there is a problem in the, my computer, yeah. Uh, you can see that uh, we do what we call uh, as a sustainability uh, certification. As we uh, apply the sustainable forest management certification. And then uh, with the timber legality assurance system, we did the all timber industry nationwide scale. If we are talking about the uniqueness of SPLK, some core principles have enabled SPLK. Become uh, a successful uh, framework. Yes, I'm sorry, there is a problem here. We're still hearing you fine, August, even if okay. we don't see your PowerPoint. No worries. Okay, uh, I would like to, to continue. Uh, the uniqueness of uh, SPLK. SPLK is developed uh, based on Indonesia laws and regulation. And then SPLK is developed by international standards, a multi-stakeholder uh, consultation process, and also uh, full traceability along the entire uh, chain of custody. SVLK also uh, as a legality and sustainability from upstream to downstream, because uh, we develop uh, 14 criteria for sustainable forest management. And the implementation involves all stakeholders, including uh, NGO consortium of independent monitors. The verification by accredited independent party auditors and 
SPLK is fair implementation dispute settlement and appeal mechanism is uh, established as a mandatory and then strong commitment to sustain forest resources. Ladies and gentlemen, the advantage from SPLK implementation that is uh, improve market confidence, better access to international markets, contributes to increase export revenue, reduces forest degradation and deforestation, improve image of Indonesian time timber products, assurance on proof of legality and traceability for trade partners, strong marketing potential for customer and improve forest governance. Our approach uh, to reforming uh, standard in timber uh, sector is holistic. Our system rules for sustainable forest management and combating illegal logging apply across all of Indonesia and are permanently embedded in law. As I mentioned that Indonesia has re reformed its forest management paradigm into a holistic landscape management through multi-business forestry. It leads to a more economically thriving forestry business. The result uh, illegal logging is estimated to have fallen by 63% since SVLK was established because uh, SVLK uh, required the social, environment, economic aspect. For the social, there is a recognition of customary land right for indigenous and local people, fair distribution of benefit, conflict resolution mechanism. And then for the environment, clear demarcation of protected areas, reduce impact logging, protection of endangered uh, species. And for the economic aim to make sustainable forestry economically viable and forestry multi business approach. Uh, continues to support improvement, the strengthening legal basis of SVLK from the ministerial decree uh, 21 in the year of two, uh, 2020 to the enactment of the law 11 in the year of 2020, dealing with the omnibus law. So we continue to strengthen scope of the SVLK to cover verification of legality and sustainability as part of Indonesia's commitment to sustainability and strengthen transparency, strengthen government support to SMEs, and then implement green government procurement policy for domestic market. Result of the series of corrective measures since 2015, uh, for example, we do the social forestry program with granting local people access to, right to 12.7 million hectares. And then we implement also uh, high conservation fall values in uh, oil palm plantation, new permit moratorium since 2018 to evaluate the recent concession and halting further forest land conversion. And then the effective application of timber legality assurance system, nationally known as FSPLK since 2013. Forest and land rehabilitation targeting 4 million hectares over the last five years. Law enforcement in forest fire, forest encroachment, illegal mining, illegal wildlife trade, and unmanaged pollution. And then pitland through motorium, through motorium, moratorium, sorry, of pitland utilization. And then a forest and land fire management improved through, among other early warning system, aerial suppression by water bombing, weather modification technology, and so on. So I think uh, the achievement is the global deforestation has uh, res recently declined, and also annual deforestation of Indonesia also declined. Indonesia annual net deforestation rate has dropped by over 80% if we compare in the year of 2011. Net deforestation of 462,000 hectares took place in the year of 2018-2018 period and plummeting to just 115,000 hectares in the year 2019 and the year 2020 period. Indonesia also now updating its forest management paradigm, moving from focus on timber production alone to more holistic approach through the Indonesian Job 
creation law or omnibus law. Uh, we create the multi-business in forest area for environmental services utilization for timber and non-timber harvesting, for non-timber forest products, and for nature plantation and logging concession and forest area utilization. We do hope that the outcomes can improve the uh, increase the job uh, creation, export uh, revenue, and also productivity. Thank you very much, August. Um, I'm going to, if I may, ask you to wrap up now um, so we yes. can move on to our yes. final speaker. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, August. And, and I think that's an important uh, uh, point you've raised, in particular, highlighting trade as an incentive for engagement in tackling illegal logging and how you, the examples you offered of, of how emphasizing and promoting legal uh, uh, timber products could actually uh, encourage trade, that I think is an experience from Indonesia. And the second point you highlighted was uh, the emphasis in particular on holistic approaches to looking at sustainable job development uh, and uh, forestry management. So I think uh, very interesting points that we'll come back to in the question and answer session. If I can invite people now, please do start to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, uh, so we'll be turning to that uh, in due course. But uh, before we do so, I would like to invite our final uh, panel speaker this morning, to uh, uh, join us uh, from the Republic of Congo, from the Ministry of Forests, Joseph, Joseph Mumbuilu, you have the floor. Vous avez la parole. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Renata. And thank you very much to Chatham House also. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to such a distinguished audience of experts from around the world. We meet virtually, of course, to talk about the VPA. The VPA has been an essential tool in forest governance. And today I'm going to share the experience of the Republic of Congo. But before that, I will present myself. My name is Joseph Mumbuli. I am the general director of uh, the forest economy. And this title, uh, general director of the forest economy, gives me the responsibility of uh, situs management in Congo. I'm also the national CONIFAC coordinator. The CONIFAC is the uh, West, the Central African Forest Commission. I'd also like to thank the European Union and the FAO who have supported us. They have helped us with what we call this tool. The Congo signed the VPA on the 17th of April 2010. The objective of the VPA is to sustain, sustainably manage forests and to ensure sustainable trade and profitable trade between two parties, that is to say the European Union and Congo. And this commitment is taken up by the entire timber sector. There must be legality, traceability, and transparency in the timber verification system. The agreement entered into force into 2000, in 2013 following the signing of the two parties. The first agreement has been signed, but we need a joint implementation committee to implement the agreement. And so the JIC is a JIC between the European Union and the Congo government. And the first JIC took place on the 29th and the 30th of April, 2013. 
I think after Ghana, Congo is the country that signed the agreement, but in Central Africa, Congo is the first country in Central Africa to have signed the VPA with the European Union, but also the second country after Ghana, which is a Western African country. So the VPA and Flag T have uh, been implemented in the Republic of Congo. The VPA was one of the elements that triggered the review of the forest law. Our forest law is law 33 of 2020, established by the forest code. This law deals with the VPA because it is a requirement uh, to move closer to good forest governance, and therefore we must draft the implementing text so that we can implement this new forest law. VPA enabled the Congo to develop a tool, which we call the legality verification system, the server is hosted at the Ministry of Finance, so that we have a data center there. And the software is hosted there. Why? Well, because the VPA should boost the national economy and the Congolese forest sector in terms of tax collection, etc. And so VPA, the VPA is a very important tool. We have developed a number of modules, including what we call the fiscality module, and that has already been deployed. We also have the legality and license aspect, special licenses. And so these are two modules, two aspects that have already been rolled out. And now, Congo is doing all it can to ensure that the traceability aspect can be rolled out. And this is what Congo is looking for funding for so that we can deploy and roll out this tool. Before that, after having signed the voluntary partnership agreement, via the ministry responsible for forestry, there has been a lot of training, a lot of capacity building at the level of the departments within the country. And so those people who will be responsible for using the system have been trained. So there has been a lot of training. There has also been the drafting of procedures. There has also been the drafting of checking procedures, legality checking procedures at the first level and the second level. And this has been done in collaboration with the private sector, with civil society, and with also other administrations. The Ministry of the Forest Economy works with more than 10 other ministries, including the Finance Ministry, the Agricultural Ministry, the Environment Ministry, the Transportation Ministry, because there is also transport as well that is important. In this partnership that exists, these are all important elements for the VPA in Congo. The vision for 2022 is to deliver the first license, the first legality certificate. And so you can see that this is huge progress that the Congo has made and is making. So that we can deliver these legality certificates and the impact of the VPA is 
is first and foremost the fact that we have a new forest law. This will improve forest governance. And the impact is that there already for the private sector, for logging companies, there has been an ownership of a taking ownership of this software. And this has an impact for the other administrations as well, because the other administrations have also taken ownership of this uh, legality verification system software. And there will be bridges created between the legality verification software and logging companies and also the tax department. And so within that system, there will be links between the different ministries. So that means that forest governance is no longer just a word, it's a reality, because we will arrive at being able to control the contribution of the forest sector, both in terms of tax collections and at many levels. And the VPA is, as I said, a tool which is very, very important. And I think that the arrival of the VPA, the other impact of it is also that all of the forest concessions will have to be developed. And I think that logging companies with uh, undeveloped concessions, well, they will be out of the game and therefore they won't be able to export their timber. So the VPA has changed the whole situation to improve the situation. We have to control the resources short term as well as medium term, which means that all of the forest companies develop their concessions and all of the concessions must be certified. Thank which you, also Joseph. I'm going to ask on you if I may forest to governance. wrap up soon. Okay, okay, merci beaucoup. Je veux donc conclure. Right, thank you very much. I will then conclude by saying that the VPA has brought reforms and changes in our country, the Congo, which is the first country in Central Africa which has made so much progress. So thank you very much once again for giving me the opportunity to talk about the experience of Congo in terms of the VPA and what we have done so far and the results we have we have re uh, received, including the IT system of legality uh, verification with the first modules, tax module, legality module, as well as traceability modules of our system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joseph, and thank you for underscoring for us today the importance of the technical components for effective implementation of VPA, and that the IT system is not only a way of keeping data, monitoring and tracking, but also uh, a way to support the a real multi-stakeholder approach by being uh, accessible, by drawing in the different governments, departments involved and pro providing transparency for civil society and indeed private sector actors. So thank you very much for that. Before we go to the questions, and I'm going to ask all of you now to please enter your uh, questions or your comments in the chat box, the Q&A box. Uh, let me ask the panel uh, one question for all of you uh, across, and maybe I'll start, if I may, with you, Chris. The question is this. We are seeing that the EU, uh, the UK, and the US are all developing or considering legislation that is aimed to reduce the import of agricultural commodities linked with deforestation. 
We've also heard from the European Parliament Speaker, Madame Hautala, today, the importance of climate considerations uh, for these uh, consumer countries. I'd like to really ask each one of you if there's one lesson that you would draw from your country's experience with the VPA, what would that be for those countries that are now thinking about partnerships or changes in partnerships to tackle deforestation? What's the one lesson you'd like to draw from the VPA experience? Chris, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you, Renata. I'm sorry, I, I wonder if it's only me, but it appeared your line was breaking a little. Um, but from what I make of the question, um, I think I would, partnership, lessons for partnership. Yes, I, would... I think that's right, Chris, sorry. I was really just saying, if you, you talked a lot about the lessons of partnerships, but if there's one thing, one conclusion you'd like to draw from the experience of partnership as the producer countries now think about new arrangements, what would that be? Well, I would, I would, I would go for the uh, respect for sovereignty and the relevance of um, the objective of the partnership. I think it must be very relevant to the to the to the to the to both sides, especially to the partner country that's been drawn into it, and uh, it must revolve around uh, sovereignty in order for the partners to see that their needs are being met in the partnership. I mean, and, and also uh, still around the same issue ensure that um, the, so that is quite a bit of an amplification to ensure that um, it is not serving the purpose of say, uh, 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 one partner against the other. It is very key to ensuring that there is, there is, there is sustained interest in a partnership. Um, there are others, but you asked for one, so I would, I'd focus on this matter of relevance of its objective and the, and, the, and the sovereignty of the parties involved. Thanks very much, Chris, and a very, very clear response. So thank you, even if the, uh, there were a little bit of a bad line on the question. Harrison, what would be your one lesson that you would take? Thank you. Um, if you pass legislation in your countries not to encourage the production of um, commodities that are associated with uh, deforestation, you have to also look into the partner countries and see what you can do to help them meet that standard. I say this from the backdrop that we, in Liberia, I uh, don't want to say in Africa. Our style of farming in Liberia is shifting cultivation, slash and burn, moving from place to place. We do not have the mechanical and other logistical requirement to keep farming in one place. Even if you have to do that in a swamp, you need a swamp dozer to deroot uh, 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 the area and lay it out for uh, continuous operation year in, year out. So while that may be true, the West should be looking at how it helps Africa. And I would say particularly our country, how we meet those requirements. Otherwise, somebody who wants to grow rice, cocoa, or coffee, they will still be causing deforestation from place to place. It's not an easy thing to say to dissociate deforestation from consumer goods coming from third world countries without considering the capacity building aspect to make them meet those conditions. I think that's where I should stop. Thank you. And a very good place to stop, Harrison. Very clear response. August, what would be your key takeaway from the VPA for any new uh, legislation or partnerships that are being considered? Yes. Uh, from Indonesia experience, one among most important aspects for successful de deliberation to tackle illegal logging and associated trade is to develop a credible and robust verification system. Take for an example, the Indonesian Timber Legality Assurance System or SPLT. 
The implementation of Indonesian SPLK has been through a transparent and participative approach to involve all stakeholders. We call it multi-stakeholder engagement, verification by independent accredited third-party conformity assessment bodies, monitoring by a consortium of civil societies, as well as a fair verification process against a set of agreed standards, including the availability of appeal and dispute settlement mechanism. The VPA between Indonesia and AU contribute positively to Indonesian forestry governance. The acknowledgement from AU towards Indonesian national system of verification, including the recognition that timber export as eligible to the AU timber regulation, becoming the green light for Indonesian exporter to enter AU market, while at the same time bring amounts of incentive toward the compliance with law. And it is also affected the non-AU countries to also use the market instrument to tackle the illegal logging and associate, associate trade. That is the case in some ASEAN countries, UK, US, Australia, and Japan. And Indonesia success story store in VPA has created a benchmark for other countries. Yet it, it is not perfect, but there are always room for improvement and Indonesia are doing the best effort for it. Indonesia welcomes other countries that is interested to learn more about the SVLK. And the more producer and consumer countries support sustainable production and trade, more likely illegal logging and associate trade to be tackled. Thank you. Thanks very much, August. Joseph, um, the final word to you before we open the floor to the many questions that are now coming in. Um, one lesson from the VPA experience. Merci beaucoup, uh, Thank you so much, uh, Renata. Renata. One of the lessons is that with the VPA today, we are focusing on transparency. Everything is online. The revenue, the tax, everything is online. The Congo has really uh, got involved in transparency and in forest governance. So the lesson is the standardization of the control practices throughout the country based on control processes which have been created and tested and published. The lesson is that we have what we call AIS, which is an independent auditor, independent from the system, and they assess the whole process of VPA implementation. They then draft a report, and that's really interesting. And this shows transparency in forest governance. And of course, the reduction in illegal logging of timber. So of course, a reduction in deforestation. We have 0.05% of deforestation rate in the Congo. So these are the lessons to be drawn. And this partnership with the EU, with the European Union, this is a, an honest partnership. And this means that timber coming from the Republic of Congo will be uh, sold on the international market. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. And all four of you have pointed out, I think, very nice and interlinking lessons that uh, very much are mutually reinforcing. I'm going to open the questions now and uh, invite the first of our uh, questions uh, to speak. And that is David Saddington from the UK's uh, Foreign Office and who is head of the UK's Fact Dialogue. David, would you like to take the floor? Happy to, and thank you so much for that fascinating conversation um, there. It's really yeah, encouraging to see the experience um, and so much of this we're taking forward in the COP26 fact dialogue this year. And that's what I really wanted to, uh, to discuss. How can we best build on this positive experience of VPAs in not only COP26, 
but the UN Food Systems Summit this year, um, as well as the Chinese Convention on Biological Diversity. So we'll be really interested in any reflections from the speakers there around how do we take some of these fantastic lessons and best practices. And I should also mention that all of the countries speaking are, of course, participating in the FACT Dialogue. We have 30 of the largest uh, producers and consumer markets there where we are trying to flip that global market for commodity trade in favour of sustainability. But thank you very much all and to Chatham House for a wonderful panel session. Thanks very much, David. Um, August, you mentioned earlier in your remarks um, the UK partnership between Indonesia and uh, the UK. Do you want to take a first uh, go at that responding to the question? Sorry. Yes, I thank you very much uh, for the question. Yeah, actually, now Indonesia and UK as a co-chairmanship for the uh, FACT Forestry, Agriculture, uh, Commodity Trade uh, Dialogue. I'm, I'm sure that through the, the dialogue among the, the countries, so we can come from with the, the better uh, partnership uh, in the uh, near future. Yeah, as, as you know that uh, we have uh, already implementation of VPA in Indonesia, it means that uh, this uh, partnership has helped Indonesia to mitigate uh, illegal logging and associate trade. And the impact, uh, we have a lot of corrective actions have been implemented following the, the implementation of uh, the VPA. And this uh, corrective ac actions at least promote the global market confidence upon uh, Indonesian timber product. And then the measure have also helped Indonesia to decrease deforestation. And beside the positive impact of, on export performance and eradication of illegal logging, most importantly, uh, the implementation of the VPA has brought significant improvement on the national forest governance. Development and implementation of the uh, VPA has been through participatory consensus oriented process, more accountable and transparent, responsive, effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive and follows the applicable law. In the Indonesian context, it will be improved the image and market confidence of Indonesian timber product contribute the increase of foreign revenue. Of course, uh, through the partnership, especially in the, the, the fight dialogue, we will uh, promote the, the forest governance and also the, the, uh, the system of factory VPA system that already implemented and be sure that we can uh, improve our partnership to uh, many other forums. Thank you very much, Agus. Um, Chris, would you, is there anything you would like to add in, uh, in anticipation of COP26? Chris, if I can ask you to unmute. Yes, I don't. Yeah, so um, the little I add is, I think over time we are realizing, realizing the challenge uh, in some quarters, understanding what sustainability okay, of the resource um, is about or what goes into the sustainability of the resource. I think we are, we are, we are, we are slowly uh, getting to understanding, so two worlds about uh, our view on what is sustainability. And it's important to have a convergence, I believe, uh, in, 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 in uh, talking about the VPAs and what contribution legality can make to sustainability. Uh, we, we recognize what the panel has been talking about, that um, creating uh, an atmosphere for transparency, creating an atmosphere for um, good law enforcement, I mean, governance, a good governance environment in general is key to ensuring sustainability of the resource and therefore sustainability in trade. And I, th I, I think um, partners should come together in understanding, appreciating, appreciating this uh, so that uh, we, can, we can make uh, better progress. Otherwise, if we, if we maintain the divergent understanding, as I said, which appears to be emerging, I mean, that, that is not helpful. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. If I may uh, now, I'm going to move to another question. Uh, and if I can ask the panelists if any of you would wish to uh, respond, uh, I will open the floor to you. We have a question from James Hewitt. James, would you like to take the floor for your question? Yes, I'm happy to. Um, just the question is, will partnership agreements, not only VPAs, be able to cope with land grabs and offsets falsely presented as nature-based solutions. And that I think is going to be a topic for discussion at COP26. Um, and there's likely to be obviously corruption involved as well in some of those false solutions. Thank you. I don't know if any one of our panelists would like to take uh, that question first. Uh, Harrison, would you like to start? And then I will ask if anyone else would like to join. Um, VPA will not cope with uh, land grab. As a matter of fact, land grab is something that our country has taken step to stop. Our country passed the um, right land right law uh, two three years ago, which in effect turned land ownership to the people who live on the land in the interior. So today, our government cannot award a concession in the interior of Liberia without the communities saying yes. So land grab is completely out of the question. We respect uh, informed consent. Um, if anything has to be done in the interior of our country, the people who live there have to be informed about what needs to be done. They have to agree and the information has to be prior. So uh, land grab has no room in our country today. And I can tell you that uh, uh, VPA wouldn't cope with that because doing so tenders the timber illegal anything that is not done properly is considered not done at all or not done legally is considered not done at all so no thank, thank you. you thank you harrison uh chris i see you've turned up your microphone would you like to join in and in, in this question yes so um still talking from the the, the experience of uh, vpas i think it's important in this partnership agreement to, first of all, the clarity in defining um, objectives and the courage to understand and accept what the flashpoints are, governance flashpoints are, and a strategy to, to actually address these uh, flashpoints. So with the Ghana VPA, for instance, um, one of the reasons why uh, we, we, or let me say that one of the long running issues for resolution has been the, the allocation of rights. And once it is recognized or it was recognized that this is a flashpoint, a governance flashpoint, yeah, there, were, there, there, there was concerted efforts. It never went to the back burner. It stayed up front as well, it, it was addressed. So, um, if we can come to a point where, okay, any pretense there was uh, solutions that actually is for land grabbing is clearly defined and addressed and uh, kept on the front burner and strategies are developed. And again, here, here, here again, um, the, 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 the strength of multi-stakeholder um, and non-stakeholder participation essential in making sure that these if you like bridges too far uh, 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 crossed. Um, so it is again, all, all the tenets that are the VPA, but clearly here, we're looking, we're looking at uh, clarity and definition and uh, the courage to address, identify uh, flashpoints. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. I'm now going to ask uh, uh, our, another question that we've received. Uh, and I'm going to direct maybe August and Joseph, if you'd like to respond to this question from Tom Roche. Tom, would you like to take the floor? Uh, Tom, Hi. can you? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Renata. Thank you very much. 
Greetings from Ireland. Um, for the past 30 years, I've been looking at Ireland's imports of tropical timber. We're the largest per capita consumer of tropical timber in Europe because we have the lowest forest cover. Now, I'm very concerned that with the um, developments in tropical country regions of rising the standard of living, is it not more prudent that you guys keep your resources for yourselves so that you won't be dependent on Western society for handouts for development and so on? I mean, your, your natural resources are, are, are extremely valuable to your own people to take them out of poverty. So this is something that I, I, I just believe that every country needs to become more self-reliant and self-sufficient in light of climate change, in light of declining biodiversity, in light of human rights abuses. So I, I just feel that at this stage in our development as a society globally, we really need to become more self-reliant and not be depending on other countries for exporting our goods and services to them to bring in money. We, I think we, 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 we're in a prime uh, time now to, to start looking at our own internal devices that has made us so reliant on other countries. So Thank I, you. Thank you very much, Tom, for that question. I'm going to uh, pass the floor first to August and then also ask Joseph uh, uh, if they would like to respond and Harrison, Chris, feel free to come in. But August, you first. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I think it's uh, an interesting question. Yeah, we learn from the, the partner, partnerships in the VPA, collective VPA especially, is dealing with the multi-stakeholder engagement. Yeah. And the multi, uh, in many cases, the multi stakeholders uh, partnership is the policy trend in the forestry governance. And the multi stakeholder engagement is also an ingredient to effective partnership. It is very important with the current geopolitical condition where the role of civil society is very de determined in the direction of socio political change in the world. Therefore, the government uh, needs to invoke the support of civil society in determining uh, policy direction. So that uh, socially and politically, they will get support for the police, uh, policies taken. Civil society involvement can be encouraged by the social media, which is uh, currently a lifestyle of people in the world. And the government needs to understand and utilize uh, this media to promote the policy direction to be taken and the success that has been achieved with straightforward and transparent data and information. And I'm sure through uh, the learn from the FLEC TVPA, especially for the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, engagement, we learn a lot that we, we have on the right track to do the uh, better uh, forest governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, August. Joseph, would you like to respond to that question? Uh, we, uh, yes. Uh, yes, Renata, I would. I think that in some ways, uh, the person who asked the question is right, but I think that today we are in a global world, if you will allow the expression, a country cannot develop on its own one always needs other countries and vice versa. However, what is true, as it relates to Congo, for example, the new law, so law 33 of 2020, which was established by the Forest Code, one of the requirements is that everyone, civil society or partners, private sector, introduce the notion of FBIC in law. So free, prior informed consent. So that's the first point. And as it relates to uh, development plans, this is reserved for local community and indigenous people's areas. 
and we call these local development series. The Con Congo has more than 11% of these spaces that are dedicated to conservation. Therefore, it is my uh, belief that the partnership must be a clear partnership. It must be a win-win situation, but I don't think that any country can develop on its own. We have taken into consideration local communities in the Congo. And in the framework of logging, there are areas that are reserved for local communities and indigenous peoples. This enables them to develop micro projects. And the result is that we are able to preserve wildlife through alternative activities that generate revenue. So I say all, all of this to say that human rights are respected. No one should be sidelined, and we have roughly four million, four million hectare of developed forest, and we have more than two or three uh, million hectares of certified forest. And we respect the interests of local community, community, uh, communities and indigenous peoples. Otherwise, you will lose this certificate. You'll lose a license. So those are some of the answers that I wanted to provide for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, we have a comment from Rodrigo Ngonzo, who um, does uh, indicate the interest, Agus, of uh, Cote d'Ivoire in the Indonesian experience, and he is uh, inviting uh, lessons learned on that. But Rodrigo, you also have a question on corruption. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Rodrigo Ngonzo? If not, perhaps I can read it out. Uh, and maybe Harrison, I'll ask you to perhaps start with this question and maybe others to join in if you'd like to respond. Uh, Rodriguez writes, corruption remains a big challenge in promoting forest governance and implementing land rights and policies. How do you tackle this issue uh, at the institutional level from the top forest policy making administration right down to the ground level. And Harrison, uh, I'll ask you to perhaps speak to this question first. Yes, I do agree with him that uh, corruption remains a big problem, but there are several checkpoints. First, you have the independent auditors that is not loyal to anybody in the country. It points out the faults of uh, private sector, government, community, etc. And once that comes out, it's going to be treated. So um, corruption remains a problem, but there are solutions. Solutions are that when corruption is detected and reported, government should take action. And we want to believe that no government will knowingly ignore in this day and age uh, taking action against corruption to serve as deterrent for those who would maybe uh, planning to do likewise. We have had corruptions in our forestry sector and it led to the complete overhaul of the sector, prosecution of government officials, etc. And if it happens today, similar things will happen. The government is under the microscope of the multi-stakeholder, is under the microscope of the uh, international and local NGOs, and of course, the independent auditors associated with the VPA processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harrison. Uh, Joseph, you wanted to come in here, and there's also a question for uh, you. Affirmative. Je peux répondre, je peux... Can I answer? Yes. Merci beaucoup, Renata. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renata. It's an entire process. It's not just about waving a magic wand that will not make corruption disappear. We're doing our best to eradicate corruption 
through many mechanisms and through different structures. So for Congo, for example, we have independent monitoring. And this is mandated auditing. This is to say that the government accepted that there would be independent monitoring. So that a report is pu published. The interpreter apologizes. We've lost connection with the speaker. Oh, um, uh, I think we just had Joseph uh, freeze briefly. Uh, perhaps I can suggest that we move on to another question and hopefully Joseph can rejoin us because there's also a, a number of questions related uh, coming from him that I think would be uh, very helpful for us to be able to engage with him. Uh, maybe uh, I'm going to pass a question to you, Chris, if I may, uh, from Yoon Grant. Um, who has worked in Sierra Leone and with the tax service in Liberia. And he says, how are you, how confident uh, are you about continuous verification of the supply chains in producer countries, especially given the latest reports about private security companies in countries in Central African Republic? Um, and obviously as a timber verification uh, head, you, this is something very much uh, you are occupied with. Um, yes, thank you very much. But forgive me for the um, part of the question that referred to um, the happenings in Central African Republic. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that story, but the first part of the question, maybe it'll help um, those of you who are familiar with that, with that part of the story. But um, we, we are confident of continuous verification of the supply chains because, uh, you know, the VPA is not a project, or what, what we have established out of the VPA hasn't been a project. It's now um, part of our work practice. It has become a part of our work, work, work procedures. Uh, the, the auditing, or uh, the, the third layer of auditing that has been introduced in our work practice. Um, it's not something that we envisage going away. Um, Ghana, for instance, we have um, a, a legislative instrument that that kind of solidifies this. So um, with or without exports uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is a law that we are going to respect that before any timber is put on sale, whether on the export market or the local market, um, it should have gone through a process that enables one to attest to the legality of the of, of that timber. So yeah, we have a law back in it. It's, it's not part of our work processes and not part of our, 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 our our regulatory requirements, and so we're quite confident. But as, again, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not able to relate to that story in South Africa public. However, if you permit me, since I have the floor, I wanted to comment also on um, the gentleman who was asking about we keeping the timber trade within country. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, the reason why he says so is, there, is, is, is the reason for uh, the development objective for many, many uh, developing countries, a timber producing country for that matter, uh, we, we, we are accruing capital to develop ourselves. And, and so maybe a day will come that we'll be able to, to, to have enough resources within to be able to conduct the trade. Uh, but Ghana, for instance, uh, the still objective from our current leadership is beyond eight. Uh, the vision is going to be on eight. So all the processes we are going through is to help us to come to that very, very, uh, the, uh, meet that very objective. Um, so again, and it's, it, it is not exactly developing Western lifestyle. No, it is development our own way. Um, and and as, as, as we progress, I believe uh, things are going to pan out that way. So I, I wanted to make a, that, that, that contribution on that. We're not, we're not really looking for, it's not a matter of looking for handouts. No, we have our development objectives. Um, so that was my contribution to that question. And um, well, since time is running, I wanted to make a contribution to what um, my Congolese friend was saying, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll, if there's time, I'll come back to that. No, very much. Thanks, Chris. And thank you for placing uh, forest governance in the wider uh, goals of the sustainable development goals and the national development plans that every uh, country and countries like Ghana have put considerable effort into developing and uh, implementing. 
Um, we are trying to get Joseph uh, from Congo to rejoin us, uh, but while we are, maybe just a question if I can to all three of the panelists, but I'll start with you, Agus, uh, from Ivan Vibisono, excuse me, Bisono, from Indonesia. Perdone si lo he pronunciado bien, es, es de una persona de Indonesia. Yeah. Um, the question is, uh, besides es, capacity, si capacity de building and shared electricity, what are the other important collaborations son, among consumer and producer countries to promote sustain, sustainability? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ivan, for uh, the question. Gracias, Ivan. Uh, effective partnerships is a win-win approach for all multi-stakeholders that have different background and different needs, but share a common interest. So uh, from Indonesia, we are welcome to share our uh, experience and also information about the uh, Flective VPA. And we also uh, would like to strengthen our uh, collaboration, especially in the, the regional level, uh, because we do that uh, our uh, export not only to uh, AU, UK, and other, but also in the regional level. So I think through the partnership in the uh, regional level will be uh, promote the better uh, forest governance. And I do hope that uh, we can do it from Indonesia to uh, other uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you, August. I'm very happy to say we're joined uh, once again by Joseph. The line has resumed. And so I'm going to propose that we give uh, uh, him the opportunity to take the last question, which is from Stefan Momo. Uh, Stefan, would you like to take the floor to ask your question, which was directed at Joseph? If not, if we're having difficulty, perhaps I can ask the question. The question uh, to you, Joseph, is, uh, and thank you to Flori Chazarin, who's put it in English for everybody. Uh, is it that civil society has a view or is it involved in the equitable management of forest royalties in Congo? How does the administration perceive the independent observation processes carried out by civil society in the Republic of Congo. Joseph, you have uh, the floor. Uh, uh, merci for Thank you. Question. Thank you very much for that question. If uh, you heard what I said at the beginning, and I mentioned that the Congo signed the VPA with the European Union, soon after that, there was the involvement of civil society civil society has been involved. I mentioned the mandated observation, that is to say independent observation, which was signed with the government. They produced reports and so on and so forth. I also mentioned non-mandated observation, that is to say civil society, but that is done in parallel with the work that is conducted by independent monitors who work to produce reports. So it's very interesting. I can give you an example with civil society. Today, there's a new forest law. The law 33, 2020. And we're currently drafting the implementing texts for this new law. We can't not involve civil society. Otherwise, these implementing texts will not be voted. Personally, as a member of the government, it is good to see uh, civil society being involved. Civil society now has a place, which is undeniable. And this is not just the case in the Congo. The interpreter apologizes. We've lost communication with the speaker. Civil society is a partner, which is indis indispensable for the economy, civil society can prevent corruption and civil society must always be involved. We are at a stage in Central Africa 
in terms of percentages, we have concessions, developed concession, concessions of more than 4 million hectares, more than 3 million hectares of certified uh, spaces. And this is thanks to civil society. We can't do anything without FPIC free prior informed consent. So, Renato, you can see that this is very interesting. This is very important. It's very important for civil society to be involved. Therefore, civil society has free access to uh, taxes, uh, to revenue. And these figures are all published as part of the agreement that has been signed with the European Union. Sometimes there are figures that make us see that there are gaps, and we talk about those gaps. So there is transparency as well, in my opinion. And the Congo, particularly for the Forest Economy Ministry, so this ministry, I don't know in other ministry, but in our ministry, this is the case. If there thank are other ministries that authorize NGOs, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, bring it to a close uh, for this panel. Let me just uh, close by first thanking our really excellent panel uh, for such a, a range of both presentations, thoughts, but also uh, comments and responses to, to the uh, questions and answers to the audience. Uh, Chris Biko uh, from the Forestry Commission Ghana. Chris, sorry for getting your title wrong first time, but good that we got it right uh, this time. Uh, Harrison Karnawia from uh, Liberia. Harrison, uh, delight to have you with us today from the Forestry Development Authority. Algus uh, Justino from uh, the Indonesia, from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, thank you. And uh, last but certainly by no means least, Joseph Mumbulilu from the Republic of Congo, from the Ministry uh, of Forest there. We very much appreciate your insights, your thoughts. You've set up a lot of questions. You've, you haven't answered all the questions, provoked new questions, which is exactly what we want from a panel uh, of, of this uh, great quality. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, to all the audience, thank you for joining us. Sorry if we weren't able to get to all your uh, questions. There'll be further opportunities to raise them. And uh, please join us in 90 minutes. That is at 1300 hours GMT plus one for the next session on visions for 2030 and how they can be achieved. Let me also thank our excellent interpreters and all the team at, uh, at Chatham House. Thank you. Goodbye.